All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us for this afternoon's B-Sides 10th anniversary programming, brought to you live from our Common Ground studio here in Tuscany, Las Vegas. We'd like to remind you that these talks are streaming, so please turn off your cell phones. And if you'd like to ask a question, raise your hand and I will bring you a microphone. B-Sides 10th anniversary is brought to you today by our Inner Circle sponsors, Critical Stack and Valamare, our stellar sponsors, Microsoft, Silence, and our friends at the National Security Agency, as well as viewers like you. We kick off this afternoon's programming with Where in the World Are Carmen's Dollar Adjective Cyber Attacks? So please welcome our host, Alan Friedman. Thank you, thank you. And by the way, there's applause, thank you. Uh, we are so excited. We have a great show for you this afternoon. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how we make things better. This afternoon, we're going to wonder why on earth things aren't actually worse. Cyber attacks come from all points, all sorts of approaches, but most of what we're worried about are similar to why we rob banks, where the money's at. So today, we're going to look at the attacks that aren't financially motivated and say, why aren't more of them? Why aren't there more of them? We have a great panel for you. Now, a lesser panel would have just been ordinary talking heads having a standard policy panel. But our panel today is going to give you a fantastic and fun game show uh, where there are great prizes and the points don't mean anything. And we all wonder when we're going to die in a giant cyber fire. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our panel, and I have a request, which is when one of our panelists shows up at a dead run, I would like everyone to stand up and give him a standing ovation uh, as he comes. I think that is the appropriate call out for someone who is coming late. But the folks who actually made it here on time, we have a truly stellar panel for you today. Uh, our panel kicks off. Uh, with Liz Wharton, who is the VP of Ops and Strategy. Uh, she is over a decade of experience <laughs> as a lawyer working with hackers, and she is someone who uh, you should not trifle with, either in a dark alley or in a competition based on where your next meal is coming from. Uh, so, Liz, you've been doing a lot of work in security in this. Uh, how are you informed? How is your work informing you to wonder uh, when we're all going to block die in a cyber fire? Well, considering half the time I'm trying to keep the people from causing the fire, and then the other half the time I'm hoping that the folks that I work with are the ones that haven't burned my stuff down just for the lulls, I'd say over a decade keeping these folks out of trouble and working with policymakers. That's unqualified. Fantastic, thank you. And our second panelist today uh, is Chris Kubeka, who's the CEO and founder of Hypasec. She's a cyber conflict expert and consultant, uh, which she thinks of as a slightly more lucrative career than her past gig as a carny. That's true, actually. Uh, ask her to do some stunts for you later. Uh, just not all of them are currently legal in Nevada, so be careful. <laughs> uh, Chris, you've thought a lot about cyber conflict. Uh, why are you here today? Well, um, I like to discuss how to use technology to kill people. It's one of my favorite topics, and that's why I'm here. Excellent. So, true to form with our game shows, uh, our buzzers have not arrived in time. Uh, so we're going to be asking each panelist to make their own buzzing noise. Uh, so, for at least the beginning of the game, Chris is going to sound like, Aah! and Liz is going to sound like, oh, no, no, hey, hey, we talked about this. No threats of bodily harm. Yay! <laughs> You're wrong. Our last panelist, and a man who only showed up late because he really wanted to make a flashy entrance, is Bryson Bort. Uh, Bryson is the CEO and founder of uh, Grimm and Scythe and has a mysterious dark past that he occasionally alludes to uh, and uh, is also uh, makes one hell of a cocktail. So, Bryson, how has your work both uh, in the secret squirrel world and in the private sector informed your understanding of attacks that aren't, private, that aren't uh, profit motivated? Well, just like everybody else, I don't know anything, but I pretend I do. 
te technically that's my job. I thought we had this conversation. All right, so we're going to start off today with a key question. In the abstract, we uh, use the analogy of the Drake equation. And uh, your first question, contestants, what is the Drake equation? Liz. Yes, um, I'm not sure, but the solution is the numbers to my cell phone. Uh, I, I don't think that my cell phone is the right answer. Do we have another answer? What is the Drake equation? Buzz, buzz, buzz. Bryce. A calculation needed for the optimal ships to raid the Spanish main and defeat the Spanish Armada. I, I, I was not expecting a 16th century military strategic reference, but that's what you get from a West Point guy. Well, I, we can add Clausewitz too. Oh, <laughs> it's a Clausewitzian equation. It's a Clausewitz. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, that's still not correct. Uh, does anyone have the correct answer? Uh, so it's the probability of life depending on certain circumstances and conditions, and depending on certain types of technology. Fantastic. And I'm going to ask the panel to move the mics just a little closer themselves. So you start off with a bunch of very small probabilities, uh, but if you multiply them all times a very large number say the number of people, stars in the sky for intelligent life, or the number of people on the planet, it still means that there should be a non-zero risk of either intelligent life or not so intelligent cyber lifing. So your next question, we're going to play a game I like to call, if this is the answer, what is the question? So panel, if the answer is more than, one, than 16,500, what is the question? The number of times I expect to be propositioned by furries in this onesie. It is, uh, that, is that is a real risk. Uh, oh my God. Becky, look at her back. <laughs> Liz. Um, yes, that's the number of arrows I would need to take down a wide area network. That, I would feel like we should actually measure that. I think you might even be able to make it in fewer than that, but that's impressive. You have uh, seen my aim. That's not. <laughs> Uh, do, do we have uh, another answer? What Bryson. is it? Bryson. The number of new entries in the National Vulnerability Database. So there are lots and lots of vulnerabilities out there. Uh, so let's, let's talk about a couple of them. Uh, panel, what do you think was the most important security news from last week? Uh, yes. John McAfee. Yeah, it's true. He's no longer in jail. I think that's He's no. He's no longer no. in jail. Uh, I, I think that's important security news, but I was looking for something a little. Liz. Um, yes. The better question is, who's in your wallet? Because apparently hundreds of millions of credit card numbers have lots of people now in their wallet, Capital One. I, I think that certainly dominated the headlines, but I'm going to disagree. Uh, I think there was one more story that from a cybersecurity perspective was even more important. Does anyone know what it is? Buzz. Bryson. The 11 vulnerabilities announced in Wind River's VxWorks real-time operating system. That is true. Uh, that is, I, I strongly believe that. If you're not familiar with this, uh, VX, uh, v, VxWorks is a real-time operating system made by the company Wind River. Uh, it was a disclosure of 11 serious vulnerabilities, uh, many of which will be there forever. Uh, not everyone knows exactly what their real-time operating system is. This is technology that is used uh, in satellite uplinks, in digital controllers in factories, in medical devices all over the world, uh, and not all of it is easily patchable. So this is a real concern. It's a shame that the headlines were dominated by the Capital One or the John McAfee. So uh, here's a chance that redeem yourselves because still the points are, um, well, they're made up, so I'm not going to read the score yet. Um, for the muggles in the audience, do you each have a favorite vulnerability that you really like to talk about to frighten people? Liz? Printers. Because just as soon as you get the sucker working, you find out someone's using it to steal all your data and information. Ooh, that's a scary one. Chris? Um, well, I think Java related. It's in over three billion devices, and that really scares me, actually. It's everywhere. It is, and it's always asking for an update, too, which probably means always there's some bad stuff. It's in cars, planes, yeah. 
All right, Bryson, what is your favorite vulnerability to scare people with? If you have a computer, we can find you. All right, I'm now terrified. Uh, <laughs> that's just... All right, so as we've talked about, the majority of attacks that we see today, whether they're targeted against companies, whether they're ransomware, whether they're going after you know, little old ladies' computers, uh, they're financially motivated. It's the classic line, why do you go after banks? It's where the money is. Uh, but there's a lot more risk outside of just the cybercrime world. So we're going to play lightning round. I'd like the panel to go down the list and please, whoever can give us the most risks that we should be focusing on that aren't built around direct profit. So let's start. Liz. Oops, my bad. Uh, Accidental risk. Accidental risk is key. Squirrels. Squirrels still affect the uh, <laughs> electric grid in the United States more than any other type of attack. Bryson? Insider threats. Ooh. So we just had one out in the news today. Uh, there was a Pakistani man who was arrested for using $1 million to bribe AT&T officials. Nice. For the record, no one bribes Commerce Department officials. Um, That's because we look for results. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. So for these sort of non-financial related attacks, what are some of the threat actors that we should be worried about? Well, hackers, right? We're always a threat. The good news is I don't see anyone with a hoodie on or an old-timey mask. So I think these are good hackers. Are there any other threat actors that you think we should be trying to worry about? Well, you have, to, you have to break it down. You have to look at the criminals, those just looking to cause chaos. And then again, the oops, my bad, the clueless who don't realize what they're doing and the effect it will have. Whether they're a panda or a kitten or whatever bullshit name we're going to come up with because we're running out of animals. Uh, the latest one on the horizon is now Vietnam. Vietnam has started to actively hack everything in their country. So just following the rules the way the rest of us do it. So that gets us to a question of thinking about motive. So is it easy to tell the motive of, you know, for someone who wants money, pretty easy, they want the money. For these other types of attacks, is this something that's easy to figure out? Well, sometimes people want you to know why they did it. If they're doing it for chaos or the lulls, they'll tell you. Whether they're lying, another story. Uh, that's true. Sometimes people claim credit for things they haven't done. As a white man, I'm very familiar with that phenomenon. <laughs> the, uh, sorry, implying that I do it, not that I'm victim. All right, that was awkward. Uh, no, but I think your point, which is that there are lots of times that we want people to know that we did it, right? I drink your milkshake. Um, do we always have that? Well, um, not, not always. Uh, I like to say any time the Israelis are on your system because they're so good, you never know their motivation. Well, that's the question. Is it an Israeli vendor or is it the Israeli government? Well. <laughs> so, Liz, you, you talked about chaos. Should we fear the anarchists, the people who just want to break stuff? Well, going back to Capital One, I mean, doing it because you can, according to court documents, is in exposing that kind of a risk, I would have to say, yes, I'll take that answer for 100 points. Oh, that's true. Unfortunately, your points have been ransomware. So, um, yeah, sorry about that. Um, but yes, according to the court documents, uh, the suspect told another Twitter user, I basically strapped myself with a bomb vest, effing dropped Capital One's docs, and admitting it. Uh, which is not a great thing to be on the record for the FBI talking about it. Um, are there other sort of anarchists? And that was a, while we said that wasn't the most important thing, it was a big deal. Are there other reasons why we might want to worry about the people who just want to break stuff? Well, from my experience, they tend not to do as much harm. They tend to get the low-hanging fruit, but uh, there's still a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. All right. So... Now, it's time to take a quick break and get a quick note from our sponsors. Uh, in addition to the lovely B-Side sponsors, today's game show is brought to you by Bolt-On Security. 
bolt on security because sometimes you don't want to be asked to actually build it properly yourself. Bolt on security. Why worry about now when you can worry about it later? We are also brought to you by the miracle hangover cure, hydration. Hydration. It's what's going to keep your pee clear while you're in Las Vegas. <laughs> hydration. So, meanwhile, back here. We are, after all, a game show that is nominally themed after Carmen Sandiego. So I'll have a Carmen Sandiego game. Uh, Carmen Sandiego question. Carmen Sandiego is known for using henchmen and henchwomen. So for the panel, your question is, what does henching involve? <laughs> Liz. A TPS report filed in triplicate with the top copy printed on yellow paper. Oh my, okay, that sounds frightening. Uh, do we have another guess from the panel? Well, uh, to be honest, a lady doesn't really describe it in polite company. <laughs> it's a little too much. Um, is, is there a perhaps an even better answer for what henching involves? Yes, Bryson. So it is related to the old English for hen guests or stallion. It's true. A henchman was a term for the person who worked after your horse, uh, and so it was a groom in the eight days of your when you know your knights had lots of people to help them, and so your henchman was sort of the person who did the dirty work while you got to ride off into glory. Uh, similarly, why I get to wear this fancy jacket while the henchmen on the panel and henchwomen on the panel do all of the work for this panel. So, let's talk politics. Everyone loves politics. It's always great in this conversation. Uh, people do crazy stuff over political disagreements. Um, there's discussion about parties, people, countries. Is politically motivated hacking, is that still something that we need to be thinking about? Uh, yes. yes, Chris. Yes, so uh, basically any time a uh, Soviet hero statue is moved, uh, there is a whole bunch of very interesting Russian patriotic hackers, I've been told. It, it, it turns out that, yes, moving statues has, has caused a little problem. Uh, like panels, any other I'm answer? Buzz. Dang it. He beat me to it. Bryson, I we think you're... Uh... <laughs> well, there used to be a lot more in the U.S., but then they all grew up and had kids, and now they just do real things at DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the few that got rolled up in the uh, non-crackdown. But, yeah, that's, uh, I think, a really important point, that you can now get paid to do a lot of that stuff. Uh, and I think that has soaked up some of the market in the U.S. Uh, Liz. Um, yes, well, and for as much as cities and other folks are getting held by ransomware, to say it's politically motivated is probably not as much the case. More likely than not, a lot of it is just purely accidental or realizing that you're following the lowest hanging fruit, the weakest link. Yep, that's, that's a fun answer. So uh, is hacktivism gone? Are there any regions where we still see lots of hacktivism in the world? Well, India and Pakistan, when even cricket is not sacred. <laughs> I mean, cricket might be sacred. I certainly don't understand it, so I think it's ineffable. So. Yes, but uh, did you hack an entire uh, school's website because people were celebrating their team's win? That's a cool story. Are there any other areas there that we should be concerned about? Uh, um, I've seen a lot in Eastern Europe, uh, particularly uh, Bulgaria and Romania, because they're pulled apart by Western Europe, Russia, and Turkey. When you're at the nexus of not just two powers, but three powers, things get a little sloppy. Exactly. Anything else that we're seeing today? Bzz. Bryson. So, of course, I'm going to pick on China. <laughs> now, I'd also throw Russia in there as well. I mean, there's this fine line between um, what they are independently doing versus what is state-sponsored, but I guess if you follow their party line, then it counts as hacktivism. All right. No, I like it. And we're going to get to the state stuff in just a minute, but uh, I want to ask, before we dive in there, we're slowly ramping up the scariness. So we've talked about people doing things for the lulls. We've talked about some political stuff. Uh, now. I want to talk about cyber terrorism. Is that a real thing? Who's got the right answer here? Yes. Yes, I'd like to take the first shot because, well, chaos clueless can cause 
almost as much damage as a cyber terrorist, that knowing the motivation helps. Whether it's a real threat, the end result may be the same. Anyone have a firmer answer, yes or no? Bryson. Absolutely not. Second shot fire. <laughs> so short of defacing websites, most of these groups don't actually have the capabilities. So when we're looking at these kinds of things, it's now a group effort. It turns out defense actually did get better. Go I am the cavalry. You're supposed to wave back at me, John. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to pretend you don't know who I am. It's too late. <laughs> um, and so when they're looking around it, we have now more of a group effort where in the, you know, 20 years ago, an individual hacker could get uh, really far. Now it's more of a team-based thing. And it's a lot harder to organize that way. And a lot of these folks aren't going to be taking the contract. All right. So we have a maybe. We have a hard no. So um, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a talk on cyber terrorism because an insider uh, hacked the Saudi Arabian embassy uh, and was very uh, friendly with ISIS in another uh, nation state and held hostage the entire city of The Hague in 2014. So if you'd like to know more, um, <laughs> come to my talk at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning right here and about their lovely $50 million extortion attempt or they would kill over 400 dignitaries. Uh, that, I would watch that movie, by the way. I don't know about the rest of you. I think that sounds, so we're, in addition to your talk, we're looking forward to the screenplay as well. So, and we've talked about terrorists, so let's, let's break this down. Uh, single actors, right? Is this the sort of thing, how easy is it for one person, a lone wolf, maybe they're not part of the broad organization, how is it easy for one person to uh, do some real damage? I like the fact that we get to listen to that every time Liz answers a question. <laughs> well, from having worked for the world's busiest airport as the technology attorney, I can tell you that with the latest Mirai uh, variant attacking LG screens in almost every airport in the world, not just in the US, using some form of LG screen as their signage, that one misplaced thing and suddenly nobody has signs you've created the chaos. But then you also look at the fact that one company, Aerodata, does the load balancing software for all of the major airlines and is prone to glitches. And one glitch back in April shut down seven different airlines in one fell swoop for several hours. So knowing where to go, you, one person can just have a bad software update be it a person or a squirrel. All right, so we've got a case that yes, one can make it. Panel, any other answers? Uh, Chris. Um, so one of the things we can look at is the bug bounty programs. There are some really good people out there, like uh, Chrissy back there. Uh, and there are uh, lots and lots and lots of more mediocre people who are just following a uh, well-known playbook. Wait, there are playbooks? Yes, I just are. am mediocre without the playbook. Oh. Okay. Working with you. All right. So, any other answers on can one person make a difference in this world by breaking things? Buzz. Press. So unless you're Brian Krebs, nobody's fucking with your website. <laughs> <laughs> Is that because things have gotten better or because the actors have changed? I don't know, it doesn't say anything about that in the script. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So. Uh, it's time now to play another game of if this is the answer, what is the question? The answer is three. What's the question? Uh, Chris. The number of furry propositions I might accept. Okay. I mean, that's a pretty good defense rate from 16,000 to three. Uh, Buzz. Yes, Bryson. My actual emotional maturity age. <laughs> Can confirm. Liz. The number of bitcoins that some city somewhere has refused to pay to unlock their systems. And, and do we applaud that or do we think that is the wrong decision? It depends. You know, it's really hard to get this. It's fair point. And a profit motivated attack. Do we have, a, so a, do we have a, another answer for what three might be? Uh, Chris. Um, the net 
So the number of people that were killed in a German steel mill attack, it was the first known instance of cyber used to kill people in 2013. Do we know anything else about that incident today? Um, the German BND will not release any other information other than one paragraph about it. Just that. Does the audience have other known mechanisms of a cyber attack leading directly to death? So I'm going to take the mic to you. Hi, Jay, I'm Porup, CSO Online. Uh, I had a very reliable source tell me in 1998 that in the mid-90s, a New Zealand hacker hacked a test nuclear reactor in Pakistan, causing a mini meltdown and the death of 80 engineers. I've never been able to prove it. I am glad that we have put that unsupported allegation on the internet. That is a fascinating story. <laughs> and, and hopefully, hopefully we've inspired someone to do a little more digging. I think that's fascinating. Hey, we stand behind our Five Eye partners, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but that leads to the real question here, like the big actors now, which is um, nation states. Do countries currently have the capability to, and let's see if I'm pronouncing this technical term right, F things up? <laughs> Panel. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Any other answer? Yeah. Uh, right. Close the door. <laughs> All right, now we're skiff. Yes. <laughs> Liz, do you have an alternate answer? Uh, yeah, really? Just by asking the question, I think we're going to deduct some of your points. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Trying to woman. win the audience back over to my side. <laughs> All right, well, if we know this is happening, let's actually dive into some of the really scary stuff. Are we seeing attacks against critical infrastructure? Liz. At least we mixed it up. Exactly. But you wouldn't have been able to listen to that if you were living in the Ukraine on December 23rd, 2015, where 30 substations, 230,000 people, pause, 230,000 people were without power for one to six hours. That sounds pretty scary. Do we have other examples of, you know, people getting all up in the cyber and breaking things in a way that would make us not sleep that well? Uh, so in the summer of 2014, uh, there was a raft of uh, production ICS-related attacks all across the country of Germany. It affected the pharmaceutical industry, the steel industry, the lumber industry, every type of industry, and it uh, nearly shut down their production. That sounds pretty frightening. Bryson, you're the scariest person in the room, mainly just because Ming left. Uh, Who's going to be here for DEF CON? Who's coming to my talk where I'm going to be breaking down all the critical infrastructure attacks we saw in 2018 in detail? Put up your fucking hands. <laughs> <laughs> See, you think that you can't be educational, entertaining, and self-promotional all at once, but this panel has really demonstrated. Well, so let's talk about what we can do about this then. So if countries, and maybe even the occasional individual or well-resourced group, can do something really bad, what options do we have? Can we, you know, try to stave them off? Can we convince the bad guys not to attack us? Buzz. Bryce. There are two kinds of influence in the world. There's the one where I put a gun in your face. Hi, Tyrone. And you do what I say as long as it's there. The second is where I put a bullet in your head, and you permanently do it. Well, that got grim. <laughs> <laughs> you should put that up for my nickname. <laughs> Uh, so one approach is just we have lots and lots of force on the other side. Uh, so if someone comes and attacks us, we make it clear that we're going to do this. Do we have those red lines today? Well, so red lines, I think, are more of a policy and academic thing. Sounds like the kind of thing Department of Commerce would be, you know, coordinate with NIST about. We just take action. <laughs> and then we think about it. I, I like that. Uh, are there other things that we know about how to... Uh, you know, deter organizations or countries? Uh, Chris. Well, um, ap after um, some of the EU-NATO cyber warfare exercises in Brussels and convincing um, 
perhaps influencing unduly uh, my uh, group of countries to uh, use the nuclear option to create an EMP over the attacking country, we've now been building a diplomatic toolkit so that they can actually talk to each other before they launch a weapon. You see, Bryson, not everything involves guns. Smash. <laughs> Chris. Sorry, Liz. I was going to say, look at someone else's butt. <laughs> <laughs> But it's the interdependence, creating the interdependence where if you break our system, you've also broken yours. If you break our travel, that you will inevitably take out some of your own citizens or disrupt your own industry and your own systems. I think that helps as well. I like that. So see, again, sometimes we can get newer and fancier guns that we all have to use together. Uh, I so like that one. They were I made like in China. Too. Yes. <laughs> I don't like that part. <laughs> Well, so, so let's, let's continue talking about sort of some of this new and emerging tech. So, you know, a lot of us are engineers. We like new and shiny things. Uh, is the evolution, as things evolve, is that going to make things better or worse for, you know, these attacks that aren't just crime, that are these attacks that are meant to hurt? Um, you know, is AI going to save us? Is IoT? And by the way, if anyone mentions blockchains, you lose. Can I leave the panel if I do? Oh. You've already ransomwared my points anyway, so <laughs> I've got nothing to lose. Well, now I'm going to actually make you tell a story about how blockchain can help. Oh, fudge. <laughs> okay, uh, if, not, if not blockchain, uh, what are some of the other emerging texts that we should pay attention to? Uh, Chris. Uh, there, there's a few different types of emerging techs. Uh, I'm currently advising the EU Parliament on how to use different types of artificial intelligence for warfare, but also we're concerned at uh, the University of Oxford and uh, De Montfort University with uh, quantum computing and uh, how that will actually affect the current encryption and what it will look like hacking in a post-quantum world. I like it. Can we get a contract for that too? Maybe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Well, if I've already been ransomware, I might as well talk about that place I worked that part of it avoided the ransomware. And at the airport, being able to use the smart city uh, or the IoT connected technology, but also unmanned systems. And as long as you weren't using a certain Chinese manufacturer's uh, aircraft, in which case you knew your data was going to be exploited and taken somewhere else. And, et cetera, et cetera. But being able to then take that technology and that interconnectivity and do get better data on a runway, for example, inspection, then you could, using unmanned systems, you can get the 20 minutes, 30 minutes of flight shutting down the runway, what would previously take hours, much less uh, clear data couldn't get to the granular level that the unmanned systems and the different sensors on those could. No, yeah, I think the rise of unmanned systems, both scary but also potentially useful. Potentially. And also if you're trying to get supplies uh, into war-torn areas where someone may not want to be able to go, you can do humanitarian airdrops and stuff. So. You, you hear that, Bryson? Things coming from aircraft that are drop. nice. I don't, I don't know what humanitarian is. But... <laughs> <laughs> that, the ones that... you didn't shoot down. Oh, nation building. I've heard <laughs> wow. I mean, we're liberating them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got one. Buzz. Please. Um, so it, it goes both ways. Um, all too often, we look at technology as the savior to um, overcome the fact that it turns out people do things. People use computers. The greatest surface area in any organization is People, regular people, not IT professionals, not folks who are like, I actually know what a computer is. These are the folks that think the CD-ROM 10 years ago was where you put your coffee. These are the folks that were still learning, if I turn it off and on again, it works. And so as we add additional complexity, that's called, from an offensive side, increased surface area. You've now given me more of a target to go for. Defensive products are a target just like anything else. The more defense you have, also the larger is your surface area for me to attack. All right, no, I think, so basically we should have smaller organizations and less tech. Yeah, I think we should just go back a few, you know, decades, centuries, just let's keep it simple. Well, you know. I call it my trebuchet plan. <laughs> so 
One possible explanation as to why we haven't seen more people exploiting all of these vulnerabilities that we talked about at the beginning of the game is that they are, but maybe they're not telling anyone about it. So what's the possible motivation there? Buzz. Bryce. Nobody likes to look weak. Well, I mean, with Chris around with her guns, the rest of the panel, well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I, I, I've never had an arrow brandished at me before. <laughs> you don't know the right people then. <laughs> um, are there other reasons we may want to not actually disclose successful or potential attacks? Well, Chris. Uh, well, um, litigation fears is one of them because I face that a lot, like this morning. Uh, nobody really wants to be told that their baby's ugly. Some of us still get told we're ugly. It's still not pleasant. I tell a lot of companies that their babies are ugly. And attribution ain't easy. I mean, if someone's going to take credit for it or if you're going to point the finger at another country, nation state actor, you better make sure that you are correct and that they haven't perhaps fabricated evidence to the contrary. True. No, I think that's a, a great point. Hard to attribute. So, audience, have our contestants, who are currently all tied, uh, have they successfully answered your concerns about why we're not all being pwned left and right by arbitrary bad actors? Does anyone have any questions? This is the time for audience participation. You can also participate forcefully. You made eye contact. Do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, no, that doesn't, blocking, blocking eye contact doesn't stop it. What's your question? Unless you're talking about a retinal scanner, in which case that may work temporarily, but you still won't get in the door. My, my cybernetics aren't that advanced yet. Mm. Yes. Um, do you foresee anything worse happening in the near future? Uh, yes. <laughs> Most definitely, yes. So I'm going to disagree. I think that, I, I don't think we're going to see the digital Pearl Harbor. I think instead what we're going to have is the death by a thousand paper cuts. And we're going to continue to see little slices of things as our adversaries, because it's not just about cyber, right? This is not a game where it's just computers and that's the only part of the playing field. It turns out we have other assets that are helping protect us. And those are very much part of the equation of any other nation state that's doing something to us, which is why we haven't seen anything, say, in critical infrastructure crossing that proverbial red line because they know the result is not going to be that we're going to deface their website. We're going to come and bum the fuck out of you. I feel that should also have been your nickname <laughs> as well. Mm. Yes. And you also have to look at, too, what, what's the motivation? Because if you completely cripple something, someone, they become useless. And if you're just trying to cause chaos and disruption, then you can do almost as much damage as one criminal attack or one clueless attack. I mean, it's what are you trying to accomplish? What is your motivation and the outcome or desired outcome? Yeah, if I can tag onto that, that's one of the big challenges we have in critical infrastructure, particularly things like election systems. I don't have to technically compromise an election system to undermine the public trust in the democratic process. And so a lot of these things really are looking at the human psychology of what's the impact of what it looks like I'm doing or the perception of what I'm doing, which still has the end result. Question there and then there. Okay. Hi, Chrissy. Um, question for Bryson, really. Uh, you said that you don't think cyber terrorists have got the capabilities to do much. Um, why is it then you think that governments are actually taking out hackers with airstrikes? So, for example, Israel and also the Amer America did it a few years back as well. So uh, the Israeli airstrike actually didn't take out anybody. Um, they bombed a building, and there's a lot of discussion about what actually happened on the ground, which I won't go into, but um, that story might not be as cut and dry as it, as it looked like. Um, I think the better way to look at it is um, hackers are a capability um, like any other capability to establish effect, whether that's psyops, spying, actual kinetic strikes, um, and so they're just now a part of the battlefield like anything else. Any other comments from the panel? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Klaus. How bad does this situation in the US have to become for the Russian meddling in the last election to become considered a slowly creeping cyber Pearl Harbor? What if in a few years, maybe five, six years from now, we have still a racist in charge in the US and shootings happening every single day and democracy failing? Would you then go back and see 2016 as a cyber Pearl Harbor? to the whole panel. I'll, I'll take it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so I, was, uh, I had a, an interview with CNN this morning, and uh, the primary discussion was around that concept. Mm -hmm. What was that, self-promotional? Uh, Sorry, uh, wait, wait. I, I, I it believe, airs at 5 o'clock. I believe the appropriate <laughs> response is, ooh. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, but seriously, because he didn't want to talk about the cyber impact. He wanted to talk about the people aspect. And he wanted to go, what can we do about it? And um, while I do not have a lot of domestic law enforcement experience, um, most of my experience has been OCONUS, um, uh, a lot of what I discussed there was solutions through community engagement to solve the radicalization piece. But going to your, your question about the Pearl Harbor aspect of 2016, um, to a degree, that's I think that's more of a, a judgment call because I think Pearl Harbor was such a stark event that really shifted world history, and you could argue perhaps the 2016 election did it well. But more importantly is in 2018, we did something about it. Um, and you can see where US Cyber Command went over and said hi, and they did it in two phases. Uh, going back to my comment about influence, the first thing they did was all of the uh, Russian agents or motivated patriots at the IRA in uh, Leningrad um, received messages pop up on the screen that said, hey, we know you're doing this, hello. Now, that only goes so far because, you know, the GRU officer was standing right behind him and they're like, yeah, continue. So that didn't work. But then what we did do is we completely took them offline. And at that point, I always have the aphorism, a hacker can't hack what they can't touch. And the IRA's capabilities were degraded to the point that they couldn't touch anything. So something, there was a response. Again, segregating what is the national security response versus you know, perhaps domestic policy pieces, I can only answer part of that. Chris, thoughts? Um, well, uh, I'll be uh, writing a paper with a German think tank SNV to present at the German Marshall Fund in October for the EU-US joint response for malicious cyber activities this year. And so some of the things that we're going to be addressing is not something to deal with perhaps uh, directly the administration, but the actual response on, um, say, between the EU and US Cyber Command and so forth. And I think one of the things that is important to, I'm sorry, Chris, get this out. Oh, no I, no, I am not wanting writing a white paper with a think tank <laughs> this year, instead focusing on the third party risk and the compliance. So hardening other systems to make it harder and so that you know what your, you know, who you're dancing with and what's coming your way so that companies and individuals can make better decisions on how to allocate their resources. But uh, there are no international uh, folks paying me to write my <laughs> thoughts and research. Uh, should, should we go around the room and see who is getting paid to write an international think tank? <laughs> uh, the, um, and I think it's important to acknowledge the distinction between an information operation and what we might call a CNE, like computer network exploitation. Uh, and Bryson pointed out that often they are going to be on the same landscape. Uh, but for, for this, we tried to sort of leave aside the info ops and focus on the fact that if everything is broken, why aren't more people smashing? Why is it just Bryson that's smashing? Uh, that's not attributed. Yes. <laughs> Attribution ain't easy. I didn't do it. Which <laughs> wasn't me. I, I think we've got the makeup for uh, a pretty good song if it hasn't yeah. been written. Uh, further questions? Yes. Uh, we got a mic coming through. Uh, so, are we seeing any uh, trends in nation states using uh, kind of third party contracted uh, hackers from other countries, or are we seeing more uh, staying internal within their own home country? So, it's, it's been more internal, and a lot of that has to do with control. Um, now, that being said, there's, there's a fine line between, um, from an outside perspective, what looks like an independent party, and that's where I was teasing about the, the hacktivists and the, the motivated patriots who are just doing this versus 
they're actually on the payroll. Um, but I do think we're going to see more of that. I think as the um, as we see uh, additional activities, I think we're going to see um, a lot more introduction of those kinds of third parties in the next five years, particularly as uh, we look at the continued democratization of offensive techniques that are being leaked. All right. I'm going to now ask the panel one final question, uh, which is, you know, here in front of God, hackers, and a video camera, uh, what should we be focusing on if we're worried about this growing risk you mentioned of sort of people not just going after a quick buck, but actually breaking things and harming other people uh, and systems? What do you think we should be focusing on from a technical perspective and policy perspective? Um, you know, I've now given you hopefully enough time to formulate an answer. Uh, what do you think? Well, I'll say it, on some level, it doesn't matter to me who was trying to do what if the end result is the same. And, you know, whether the keep talking about the clueless, the criminal, the chaotic, if the end result is a system isn't working or the, you know, I can't turn on my lights as an end user, then knowing exactly what the impact is, but just knowing the risk landscape, knowing what you're doing, the companies, the different things that are playing into your environment and having a good feel for that and knowing what you can do on your end because you can't always control the actions of others. Um, I would like to see more countries adopt the Dutch model for requirements for coordinated and responsible disclosure from every company and vendor. Uh, without that, uh, you have fears of litigation, censorship, or just not having any sort of program, uh, being able to acknowledge somebody handing you a vulnerability or exploitation information. And I would really like to see that much more. Also, in draft UK IoT regulations and other areas that are growing around the uh, also, there are certain parts of the US government that have been actively promoting coordinated vulnerability disclosure for about four and a half years now. You can take credit for that there. Well, the U.S. government, but yes, it's the... Uh... <laughs> the rest of us just aren't doing anything. Yeah. Speaking of which, Bryson, what should we be focusing on? <laughs> so um, my biggest concern is the promise of the Internet that we were all given is that this was a way that, one, we were going to find um, data would be set free. Right? Remember when that was a thing? Remember that it would be easy for all of us to find truth and information would all be level? And what we've seen instead is the world is starting to balkanize. And it's really bifurcating into those who believe in an open internet and repressive regimes who have now seen the ability to control their populace. And they're starting to close themselves off in these enclaves. China's already done it. Russia's already looking at doing it. And I don't think that's going to stop. I mean, those are not countries that we can influence enough to prevent them from doing that. But that doesn't mean that the promise of the internet is not something we can still see as the standard in the international order. Now, that's not something we can dictate. As, as much as we have a lead as the United States, it's something which is the opposite of everything I've been half joking and half saying throughout this. And part of this is this was scripted, what I said, so don't take everything I said with face value. This is the only part where I'm actually allowed to go off script and say something, is detente. We actually need to be building detente with all of those countries to be able to continue to establish a free and open internet against where these repressive regimes are going to continue to just carve out their piece and let's hope that they can't force other regional players into that and create their own internets. All right, that is an actually a note of hope of saying let's keep the internet as awesome as it has been. Uh, I hope you'll join me in thanking our great contestants. They've each won a pair of the socks that are floating around as freebies that didn't end up in the bag stuff. So well done, everyone. Uh, also, travel assistance today was brought to you by weather delays. Weather delays. It means you won't get a free hotel room. Weather delays. Uh, so I hope you will all follow these brilliant people on Twitter. Uh, they are both erudite and educational. And uh, I hope you will all join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>